This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Patrick, as we navigate the summer doldrums, I want to move on to your chart deck, which happens to be titled Summer Doldrums. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click the red button that says Looking for the Downloads. Patrick, it's summer. It must be doldrums. What's going on here with the S&P on page two? Well, you know, you had to highlight the fact that I put a question mark at the end of it to ask whether, in fact, it will be the summer doldrums. But it is worth uh, talking about just how this market continues to develop. I mean, we've in these post-game sessions, we've had a number of charts talking through the way the S&P has been developing all year long. On this first chart, I just put that 50-day exponential moving average on there. And uh, basically, every correction this year has more or less found immediate support on that 50-day moving average, reversed and began a new bull run on the upside. And it, just like clockwork, we had you know a 50-plus percent retracement of the prior advance in the market, hits right into that 50-day and bounces. And uh, it's going to be really curious as to whether this is, is enough for the bulls to take this market to a higher high, because I want to kind of uh, put some other uh, things into perspective than just uh, what may obviously be this perception that there was a buying opportunity that just occurred a day ago. So the first thing I want to highlight is that if we go on page three, I just circled a couple sequences in the middle of market corrections. And, and again, I want to emphasize corrections. We're not talking bear markets and crashes and things like that. But often when the first wave of selling comes into a market like I've circled here, often you're going to get this reflexive snapback rally. And in the past, those rallies last about 48 hours. And what usually will happen afterwards is the market will re-resume and go back and continue correcting downwards to establish a new base from which a rally will begin. And I think it's actually a really important moment on the S&P 500. Now that we're uh, you know two days off of the low, will the bulls make this stick or will this roll over again for uh, another wave of correction on the down? Downside. But it, it, in order to kind of give us clues uh, as to how that is developing, I have a couple other interesting charts. So first of all, I wanted to highlight on page four the relative sector performance in the markets. And uh, obviously, the energy sector has had an awful uh, run as the cyclicals are being rotated out of. And it's interesting, crude oil, where it is, this type of a material underperformance of this sector is a bit surprising that it's this deep. But again, beyond the technology, the areas and sectors that have continued to do well are the defensive-oriented ones, healthcare, communications, utilities and REITs held up. And it really uh, tends to be a lot more of the cyclical ones like basic materials and financials that continue to contribute to the weakness. But what I also thought was really interesting was the extreme readings we're seeing on a lot of breath or sentiment indicators. And so one of the things that, uh, Eric, that we put on before was the number of a percentage of stocks in the New York Stock Exchange that were trading above their 50-day moving averages. Well, this reading early Earlier in the week, hit pretty close to 25. And what was really interesting about that is, is that if you go back and look at the last three years of markets beyond the kind of more ominous 20 plus percent market drops that we had, every time the market has gotten this oversold on uh, based on this kind of metric, it led to a buying opportunity. But what's amazing is that the S&P 500 is not even 1% off of its highs. And so the, the, these readings are almost reading as though there were these extreme downside moves and this correction was so robust. But yet, from an index perspective, there is no sign of that correction. And that is obviously a lot to do with uh, the breadth and the leadership and the fangs that we've highlighted in the past. But it's not just the readings like this. If we go to page six here, 
where I have that CNN fear greed index. We are based on their readings at 24, which is a rating of in the extreme fear category. This having been down into the teens just earlier in the week. Again, we're a situation where we're less than a percent off the highs, but from a fear greed index uh, perspective of the way that uh, they calculate this, we seem to have very negative or extreme sentiment towards the market like if the sky was falling. And I'm, I, I'm spending a lot of time trying to reflect how we can have such divergent readings on these things versus the index. And, you know, it really asks the question as to whether there is still something more ominous coming for the stock market, or is it really just going to be able to brush all of this off and just re-resume in bullish fashion? Well, and if you really look at what this chart is telling you, Patrick, it says that maybe there's a setup for a launch from here, a melt up to much higher numbers. And believe me, I don't think that those valuations make any sense. But the crack up boom narrative does make sense. And that could explain maybe a, a coming big move because we're at a sentiment extreme that should be a setup for a big move up in prices, shouldn't it? Well, you know what? I certainly don't want to rule out the possibility that that becomes the unfolding reality. But uh, my speculation is that it's entirely possible that the summer ends up being far more range bound with so many cross currents and so many different things that with the, many of these, um, the FANG leadership stocks being so overbought, some of these other sectors simply not rotating. Like if Darius is right and there continues to be a disinflationary rotation, then the things that are most oversold are not imminently going to start rallying. Maybe they will months from now, but maybe uh, the the stock market may be far more in a topping formation where, you know, 4,400 or in that zone ends up being the high and the market just chops sideways for the rest of the summer. You know, it, it, we're going to continue uh, to give everyone updates here week in and week out to kind of see how this develops, but it really is interesting. Uh, you know, I've been watching charts for 20 plus years and I don't remember a market with this kind of divergence in it. And it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out. Patrick, let's move on to a subject that I've been musing on for years now, which is junk bonds and the credit spread. And we've got page seven here. What's this chart telling us? So what's interesting is, is that the way that bonds have traded all year, like when we're talking treasury bonds, they've gone through a, a, a horrible decline and, and then a rally. But junk bonds, because they're shorter in duration and much more correlated to equity, seem to have weathered the storm very well in a period where many categorize as a, a bit of a bond bear market that occurred earlier. But uh, what we saw earlier in the week was the first legitimate kind of um, – fear spike in credit spreads. We saw credit spreads rise from just a slightly above 3%, about 3.5% on the, the um, OAS credit spread reading, which is the differential between treasury and the yields on these junk bonds. But just like the stock market, it quickly brushed it off and then heading to the highs. And uh, it's interesting, but these junk bonds continue to trade more and more like the stock market and less and less like the bond market. And uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, whether or not that correlation to the equities uh, continues. Patrick, let's talk bond yields on the 10-year treasury. What's going on here? Well, you know, you were talking about this in the market wrap at the beginning. What I did is I overlaid the 50-day moving average, not for a predictive factor, but it was simply to as an identifier of trend. And what we clearly have is a sequence where tr yields continue to make lower lows and lower highs, which is the uh, reverse for what bonds are currently doing. And this trend seems to be persistent. And obviously, uh, you know, Darius was also talking about uh, this idea of uh, disinflationary pressures. But really, it'll be interesting to see whether every one of these rallies gets faded and whether we go even test 1% in the coming weeks. It's uh, certainly uh, one of the top things that I'm watching at this stage. Do you think we've got a chance of new lows? I forget what the, the actual low was, with 35 basis points or something? Oh, I don't know whether I want to be bold enough to say that, but we certainly at this stage, though, um, the reflation trade and, the, and that bond bear that was running so rampantly since from November to March, that has clearly now rotated. And the question now really is how low can they take yields and under what circumstances? I think things would have to get pretty dicey for bond yield. Like there would have to be some serious disinflationary pressures, I think, for bond yields to head that that low. I think at this stage, target 
targeting 1% is a much more realistic technical target. And then if it turns into something more, we'll have to call the play-by-play then. Let's move on to my favorite chart on page nine, which is crude oil futures. Now, we don't have the moving averages on this particular chart, but that last move down was a pretty significant one because since November, we really haven't seen any sustained move below the 55-day moving average. This one took us right down to a good clean test of the 100-day. I'm not that worried about it. I think people just panicked, but you know, on a technical level, this could be the end of a dead cat bounce. We could be headed back down. What do you make of this? Uh, I'm not opposed to your view. Uh, The way that I kind of look at it, uh, just observing uh, back in March and in uh, in April through May, crude oil made substantial highs along along the $65 level, just rounding that area to 65. And um, this entire pullback that happened in the span of this last week basically came and tested that $65 level. But more importantly, when looking at the entire advance since the first quarter, this was more or less a 50% retracement of that prior rise. And so it fits all of the criteria of a typical market correction. And really, I think the evidence to me that we're going to be looking for in the coming week is, will the bulls be able to get this uh, legitimately above this kind of 70 to $72 level? And if we start getting back to $75, not only does that neutralize all the selling pressure and start to repair the chart considerably, but it really puts the launching pattern had there in play for a move up to that $80, $85 level, which could entirely happen. I'm not ready to be fully bullish on crude, but uh, certainly a key technical level was tested. And if the bulls can really follow through on uh, the strength of the last two days, the chart can definitely uh, start to get bullisher. Patrick, we talked about the U.S. dollar index and the market rep, but let's look at the Euro-U.S. dollar cross because that really is the most influential in the dollar index. And boy, on page 10, we've got a chart. Looks like we're in the red again. What does the red mean? Well, uh, you know what? All I just wanted to do is highlight the the supports that occurred on the euro US dollar. And uh, we're approaching that. And so while the US dollar strength has been very pronounced over the last two months, uh, we're approaching some very key levels. So to me, I don't see the asymmetry of pressing US dollar longs into that kind of resistance, or in this case, euro shorts into this kind of support. And uh, I think at this moment, we should watch and see how the bears react in this along these key levels before making another high conviction call on the currency. Now on page 11, Patrick, is this a a mistake on the chart? Because I read on Wall Street bets that silver had to go by the 4th of July to over $1,000 an ounce. (laughs) That is a bold forecast, Eric. But uh, in this circumstance, uh, I think the only way to define silver really for the last year has been a, a, a considerable sideways consolidation. And uh, with the recent drop last week, uh, we are slowly like a stone's throw away from some very key supports. No, not much different than the way the euro is approaching supports. And, and really, while that doesn't necessarily have to make an immediate bull case for silver, every time you approach key supports like that, it becomes a, a tactical place where you can find asymmetry in terms of, uh, of uh, attempting in a long position. And so as uh, silver is weakening into these uh, supports, so it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not it presents a, a, a buying opportunity to take advantage of it along a, a key support line. Listeners, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every day of the week by signing up for a free trial at BigPictureTrading.com. Information's on page 12 or at BigPictureTrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. 
and the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.